Okay, so I've moved from the web page into an app that I can take notes on so that I can show you the things I'm talking about in the poem. And I'm hoping that this text is large enough. I wanna keep the Poetry Foundation logo on the screen to give credit to where the poem originally came from. So we're back with vampires today. In the previous video, I talked about what I think the poem means, although I'd love to hear alternate interpretations from anyone really, especially my students. Now I'm going to go through the poem. Let me choose sort of a easy highlighter color. We'll do this green. Um, I'm gonna go through the poem and talk about some of the things I've noticed about it. We'll talk about some of the formal features and uh, we'll see how those bring to bear on the meaning of the poem. So the first thing that you can see when you're looking at this poem is that there are these three line stanzas, right? There's a name for those. Those are called tercets. You can also call them triplets, um, but, uh, you know, tercets is fine. Uh, just noticing that they're three line stanzas, right? One, two, three, one, two, three is important. So why might a poem like this be broken into three line stanzas? Well, for me, this poem is a lot about desire. It's a lot about what girls, what women want in this age of the vampire novel. And tercets are a feature of lots of love poetry. Tercets go back as far as um, Dante, who you'll remember from the Divine Comedy, most likely, um, which includes tercets, but he also wrote lots of love poetry and tercets. Lots of Italian poetry has tercets. The Terza Rima is the rhyme scheme of the Inferno and, you know, the Divine Comedy. Um, <clears throat> the, um, another poet who wrote in tercets is Petrarch. So we've got Dante, we've got Petrarch. Tercets are part of an Italian sonnet's rhyme scheme. Um, tercets have to do with the number three, right? Which is a pretty important number as far as symbolism is concerned. And um, I think that that's what these tercets are doing here. Okay, so we've got tercets, we've got these three line stanzas. How are they working? Well, Stanzas have three lines and therefore they have three line breaks. So let's talk about line breaks and stanza breaks. I'm going to use my, I'm going to erase the lines I just wrote and use my highlighter here <clears throat> to highlight the words that break the line. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> the poem begins with once. There was a year where every romance, and then we've got a line break, had fangs. That's a really surprising turn of events, right? It was hard to open up a novel without a vampire. Okay, so that's our second line break. Um, <clears throat> then we have a stanza break here between the end stopped line neck and the word soon. The stanzas break with once and then soon. Right? There's a movement forward in time. So that makes some sense. I'm going to stop here for a second just to talk about line breaks in general. What do line breaks do? Line breaks can do a lot of things. They contribute to the shape of a poem on the page. They contribute to the way that we read a poem out loud with pace and feeling. But that's not all that they do. Line breaks can emphasize meaning. They can also emphasize multiple meanings. They can double meaning or they can allow ambiguity. And so um, we'll, we'll be on the lookout for some of these things here. Okay. Um, another thing that line breaks can do is to allow a line to mean something in isolation from the rest of the poem. That is, the line can be self-contained. You might hear people talking about an especially good or thought-provoking line of poetry. That's the line standing on its own without the rest of the poem. The line break can feel a different way depending on how you read it and what the author wanted from you. <clears throat> line breaks can seem really natural, 
but they can also be jarring. They can seem jagged or off-putting, or as I said, with this change from line one into line two, surprising. Once there was a year where every romance had fangs. That's interesting, right? It would be less interesting if had fangs was here instead of down here. So let's look at the line breaks in the rest of the poem to see if there's anything else that they can tell us, okay? Soon they were on television. Later, the sidewalks, teenagers. So <clears throat> here we might think this they refers back to the novels, right? And in a way it does, but the line break shows us that the they also refers to teenagers, right? Soon they were on the television, later the sidewalks, teenagers. This clarifies the meaning, it zooms the meaning in, it focuses the meaning, not just from the novel to the teenagers. They, the teenagers, and these novels owned us with their hackneyed plots. And then we've got an end stopped line again right here. Platinum fleur de lis emblazoned on their jeans. That's three end stopped lines in the stanza. The next stanza has two, right? We've got a comma there and a period here. How do they wash them, I asked. They don't, my friend said. This line break is helping to separate quoted material from the source, right? It's part of what keeps them so dark and stiff. Having something at the end of a line emphasizes it. Sometimes it's a place of privilege in the line. And the fact that she repeats dark and stiff here makes that line break even more prevalent. It's what part of what keeps them, the genes, so dark and stiff. But them can also refer to this they, which is the teenagers right? An entire generation of teens has arrived dark and stiff. Unlike here, it's in a jammed line that pushes you quickly to the next, even through a stanza break. Unlike my pliable, light, pubescent ears, years, sorry. Um, I'm going to switch my color here to show that there's sound repeating here. Um, unlike my pliable light pubescent ears, uh, years, I grew up reading Little House on the Prairie. You've also got repeating sound with Prairie and Mary. Um, this is meant to sound, I think, childlike in a way. If you think back to rhymes that you remember from your childhood, they're going to be really close rhymes. Mary, Prairie, House, Mouse, Cat, Hat, right? Um, this is, this is purposeful here. Back to the line breaks. We've got Mary and Mustangs, Malaria and Paw, right? This listing transcends the line break and the stanza break here. The line break here, I want to make sure to talk about a lot. Now they have boys, right? So boys in itself is different from Little House on the Prairie and Sweet Blind Mary, right? But not only do they have boys emphasized, they've also got boys who are so angry they transform into wild shirtless dogs. This end stop here makes us pause and think about the relationship between these two lines. They're maniacs, these fans. They beg their mothers, again, we move forward quickly, to drive them to the theater where they burst into dollars, right? Where they burst takes us somewhere surprising here, right? We wouldn't expect them to burst into dollars and popcorn. We might expect them to burst into tears. We might expect them to burst into laughter or cries, but not dollars and popcorn, they're lured from their couches. Again, that's quickly. They're eager to be taken from their lives and placed directly into the vampire's mouth. Younger and younger. This line break emphasizes youth. And then the question, is there nothing anyone can do? So that's all I'm going to say about line breaks. The next video will be about other things in the poem. <laughs>